welcome to online church. We miss you guys so much. Yeah. It's so amazing to be able to stay connected online. We just want to remind you of a few things. This service is pre recorded. So we are available for you as we're watching the service together. Jump into the comments, say hello. We miss everyone so much and we would love to hear how you're doing. Also, you can share some prayer requests so we can all be praying together for everything that's going on right now. Another re reminder is that the description of this video is packed with some amazing resources for you. You can access private ways to share prayer requests. You can access all the tools you need to give online. You can also access some amazing resources we've put together for families. Make sure to take advantage of all of those amazing tools in the description. One of the greatest things that we are missing during this time, it's the first Sunday of the month and usually we would take communion together. I just want to remind you about something. That when Jesus instituted communion, he did so over a regular common meal. Even last week we talked a little bit about symbols. What he did was take common items around the table and brought new meaning to them and they became symbolic of what was going to then happen just about 24 hours later in that mm -hmm. period. So we want to encourage you as a family to be able to take communion together. Even though we are separated, you could still be able to take communion together as a family. We are going to try to do that part of this service on Good Friday and also on Easter Sunday together. So if you want to go ahead and get certain elements, but use what's in your house, don't feel like you have to go out and get groceries specifically for that. Use whatever you have because the whole point is what meaning are you bringing to it? And we want to take the opportunity to be able to take communion together as a church family. Well, as we get into today's message, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the most important questions you could ever ask. And the question is about the identity of Jesus. Who is this? This is the question that they asked on that first Palm Sunday. And we're going to ask that same exact question and try to answer it today. God bless you guys as you take a listen. Hey, Shady Rest folks. Today is Palm Sunday. Can you believe it? It kind of doesn't even feel like Easter week, right? With everything that's going on. But on Palm Sunday, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem one week before his resurrection. This symbolized the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Interestingly enough, though, Jerusalem was never the center of Jesus' earthly ministry. While he was here on earth, he ministered in regions around Jerusalem. However, Jerusalem was always the end game. To set the stage for you for Palm Sunday, there was a growing anticipation about Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. He had already predicted on at least three different accounts that he was going to die and that he was going to die in Jerusalem and that his ministry was going to end there. In Matthew chapter 16, there's a question that Jesus poses that is really, really important for every person to be able to answer. And this question is going to be the framework of today's message. Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Now, this question is as important today as it was back when it was asked. It could be said that this is the single most important question in all of history because who we believe Jesus to be has a direct on effect on what we believe that he would actually do that he did during Easter week and his resurrection and who he is in our lives then. How we answer that question is so critical. In reality, most people do not question whether or not a man named Jesus Christ actually walked this earth. The question goes deeper than that. It's a question of identity. Who is Jesus? Was Jesus just some man who walked on the earth a couple thousand years ago? Was he even a good moral teacher? Or was he indeed God? The debate is raging over who the identity of Jesus is. And this really has been the center of most of the false teaching that has ever occurred within the church centers often around the identity of who Jesus is and what he did and what it actually means. This question is posed by a group of people during Palm Sunday in a little bit of a different way. And the title of this message is, Who is This? It really is the same question that was asked by Jesus directly in Matthew 16. So today I'm asking you that same question. Who is this? 
On Palm Sunday, this question was asked by members of the crowd, and it reveals that even people who saw Jesus, who followed Jesus, who are in the crowds and saw all the works that he did, still didn't truly know who Jesus was. So here's my one true statement for you this morning. Who is Jesus is the greatest question that we will all have to answer. Let me say that again. Who is Jesus is the greatest question we will all have to answer. Because according to scripture, we all will bow and confess that he is Lord, that he is the name above all names, whether we do it now while on earth or we do it in eternity in judgment separated from him. So how we answer that question is extremely critical. So what I want to do today is I want to try to answer that question. And I want to do it by looking at three different groups of people that were in the crowd during Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. So if you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21, looking at verses 1 through 11, and then we're also going to jump back to Matthew 16 uh, toward the end of the message. If you want to follow along in the version event, we have created a version event for today's service, so you can follow along in that way and uh, in your electronic device. So I want to answer that question again by looking at three different groups of people who are present on Palm Sunday and how they responded to this question. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? So let me set the stage for you. When Jesus is about to enter into Jerusalem, it's the time of Passover. So during Passover, Jews from all across the known world at that time would descend back into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. So within this crowd, you had a number of groups of people. You had people who were natives to Jerusalem, who lived there. You had people who had followed Jesus from Galilee because he was like this traveling itinerant minister, and he was the talk of the town, and a crowd literally was following him as he was going about town to town doing miracles. And then you also had a group of people that wanted to see Lazarus. A couple, if you go back a couple chapters in Matthew, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, you can imagine if a guy comes back from the dead, it's going to be a pretty popular thing that you want to see right? And so people were following Jesus just to get a look at Lazarus to see this man who once was dead, who is now alive. So you have that crowd of people as well that are also part of this crowd that are descending upon Jerusalem. What I want to do is I want to go ahead and just read the first eight verses of Matthew chapter 21 to kind of set the, the stage of everything that is going on during this time. And then we're going to look at the three groups. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 21 starting in verse 1, and it reads, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Verse 3, If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. They, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, verse 5, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Verse 8, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Thus, Palm Sunday, when they spread the palm branches on the road. So here's the first group of people that we're going to see that are in this crowd. The way that they respond to Jesus is they use a title that is very particular, especially to Matthew's gospel. They say, Son of David. So group one calls Jesus Son of David. That's how they answer that question. We'll look at what that means. Verse 9. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now the crowd shouted the word Hosanna, which literally means to save or save now. It's a plea to be saved, but it had become an expression of praise to God. So the crowd is praising God for the arrival of who they identify as this son of David. Now the question becomes, 
What does it mean when we see this phrase, son of David, especially because it's very important in Matthew's gospel? What does that actually mean? It tells us a little something about how these people actually view Jesus. The answer to this question is found back in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 13, again, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 13, this is how it reads. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. These are the words of God directly to David in what's often called the Davidic covenant. This is an agreement that God made that somebody from the line of David would always be establish his throne in Jerusalem, that somebody would descend from that line. So David's throne would be established forever. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew actually tracks for us Jesus' actual genealogy all the way back through David and even before that. So we see that Jesus by birth actually comes through the line of David. This is really important because that means that he can be a fulfillment to this prophecy, to this promise that was made way back in 2 Samuel. So in light of this promise, by using the title Son of David, what the Jews were saying is they were identifying him as a king. They were doing the right thing in that way. They were identifying him and they were longing for this king to come that they called the Messiah. They were, this was an identification of calling Jesus this Messiah, this promised deliverer who would come and deliver them literally from the line of David. We could say instead of saying son of David, you could say descendant from the line of David. Okay, that's basically what it means. So for a short time, people in the crowd rightly acknowledged who Jesus was as the Messiah King that was spoken about. However, just a few days later, Jesus would not be the King that they envisioned and some of those same people would be yelling, crucify him. So here they are saying and identifying him as the Messiah, but he wasn't the Messiah that they thought he was going to be. And so they would then turn and say, crucify him. Such a crazy thing when you think about it, just a few days later. Why did that happen? Not only did it happen, of course, in God's grand plan of all things, because he prophesied it and we know that it was meant and going to happen, but also it happened because the Jews were looking for the wrong type of Messiah. They were looking for somebody to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. If you read throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, unfortunately, Israel, the people of God, often played the harlot and in forsaking their relationship with God, often found themselves in oppression by other peoples in other lands, whether it was Assyria, whether it was Babylon. In this case, in this time, it was Rome, okay? So they believed that this Messiah was going to raise up and finally reestablish David's throne, authority, within Jerusalem, and that the kingdom would then be established again, and he would overthrow whatever power that was there, and in this case, it just happened to be Rome. So they were looking for a political savior, not a spiritual one. Let me say that again. They were looking for a political savior. They wasn't looking for a spiritual one. The Jews wanted this Messiah to drive out Rome, to take the leadership over, to bring prosperity to Israel. But they neglected to see that man's primary need is not a physical one, but a spiritual one. That is the primary need of all humankind. All humankind, we don't need somebody on a throne to be able to provide certain earthly things. We have at our core being a spiritual deficiency, a spiritual need that needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, they were looking to Jesus as the wrong type of Messiah. Stuart, Stuart Weber, in his commentary, says this about this passage, and it's worth reading in its full. It says this, What the people failed to understand was that the king had come to defeat a much greater enemy than Rome, an enemy that knew no national boundaries or respected no political or sectarian differences. It was an enemy whose defeat would have repercussions far beyond the end of this life. Jesus had come to defeat Satan, our own sin, and the very claim of death. This is what our Savior came to do. Not to establish some political rule, but to save our souls from a much 
greater and unseen enemy. The unfortunate reality is that there are people just like who are in this crowd who said son of David and may have identified Jesus initially at the forefront, rightly so, but they're not looking for the Jesus who will save them from their sin. They're looking for the Jesus that will save them politically speaking as well. Is that not so relevant to us today? A lot of times we look toward man-made government and think that the government is going to save us. The government is never meant to be your savior. Why do you think people antagonize over political elections when their candidate does not get selected? Why do you think that people agonize and feel like the world is going to fall apart because their candidate is not selected? They are looking for a political savior and not a spiritual one. Our God, Jesus, is a king. His kingdom knows no end, and his kingdom is much greater than any political realm that we're speaking of. And that kingdom is greater than any kingdom on earth. So the question is, what kind of king are you looking for? The one who will bring cheaper health care, or the one who can heal your soul? The one who can eliminate national debt, or the one who will eliminate your spiritual debt? Jesus is a whole lot more than some politician trying to pump up hope for a temporal time and space on this earth to think that they'll be able to give you what you need when our hope has to be in him. We need to see him as the right type of savior. With everything going around us right now, we don't need a political savior. This world does not need a political savior. Man is going to let you down. We see party lines fighting right now over decisions being made, life and death decisions with this epidemic that's going on around us, and I do not envy the decisions that have to be made. And I would encourage you right now, no matter what side of the fence that you may play politically, this is a time for prayer. Pray for your leaders, okay? This is a, a deep time for prayer. We need the wisdom of God to invade time and space that right decisions can be made for the government institutions that God set up, okay? However, we do not look to them as our savior. We look to them as playing a role that God ordains. However, we look to God as our savior, our source, our hope, our stability, our grounding in the midst of this chaos. Because he's the only one who will be able to see us through. Our God is a king. His kingdom is greater. The question is, do you trust his rule or the rule of man? Because we need a savior for our souls. The second group I want you to see is found in verse 10. Verse 10 and 11, this represents to me kind of the majority crowd. I'm calling this like the crowd kind of thing. They ask this question, who is this? And the answer is they call Jesus a prophet. So the second group identifies him as a prophet. Verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? this is the question. And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Really important. Notice the response of the crowd is in light of the question. I, I picture in my mind this question being the people who are the native Jews in Jerusalem who are saying, what's all the hoopla about, right? And then the people answer by saying, this is the prophet Jesus. It's kind of like when you read a lot of the New Testament as well, a number of people, especially the religious leaders, call Jesus teacher. They identified him as having some ability to teach or speak on behalf of God, but they never identified him as actually being God. And so they call him, in this case, a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet essentially means one who speaks forth truth. In a biblical sense, a prophet was a person who speaks God's truth to other people. Prophets at time had spiritual insight and they would declare the word of God as presented like in the scripture. We can even think of preaching almost in a way as speaking prophetically. But they also sometimes had insight to events that had not happened and they would speak on behalf of God about events that had not yet transpired. Jesus absolutely fits the description of a prophet. As a matter of fact, one of the prophecies about Jesus was that he would be a prophet like Moses, like the second Moses, essentially. But that reality is he's much more than just a prophet. Was he merely a person who spoke on behalf of God, or was he actually God speaking? Big distinction there. 
Did he just speak on behalf of God or was it God actually speaking? Listen, I have the opportunity just right now on this video and on Sundays and, and other different avenues to be able to speak on behalf of God. All right, I get to be able to proclaim his word. God has called me into that role in leadership to be able to do that. And I'm so humbled by that responsibility. But there's a difference between speaking about God and being God in the flesh. Now, I can speak about God, but I can't provide salvation. I can speak about God, but I can't die for the sins of people and then ultimately resurrect. All I can do is point people to the one who did that for them. All I can do is point people to Jesus. And here is Jesus about entering into Jerusalem. He's already predicted his death a number of times over. And even if people were good Jews who understood the Old Testament, the Old Testament said many things about Jesus' coming and his subsequent death, but Jesus out of his own mouth, between Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 21, three different occasions, talks about his death and his death coming in Jerusalem. And so here is Jesus entering in, about to die, as he's already prepared his people and his disciples and the crowd that's following him to provide their salvation for those who would actually believe in him. His death and his identity have long been prophesied about and spoken about directly, and yet the crowd still did not understand who he was. They thought he spoke merely on behalf of God, but that he wasn't indeed God. Here's my thought about how that relates to today. I think that this is the majority thought of a lot of the crowd. Some people just want to hear about Jesus. Some people have no problem about you talking about Jesus. As a matter of fact, a lot of people think that Jesus is some good moral teacher, that he had some good things to say that are applicable to life. Some people think that he is a prophet on behalf of one God, but not the true and only God. Some people believe that he, uh, he lived an exemplary life that we could be able to look at and to be able to emulate, but it never moves beyond that. It never moves beyond the point of, is he just somebody we emulate and listen to, or is he God speaking authoritatively about who he is? There's a whole lot of conversation going on in general about who Jesus is, especially around this time. We find ourselves around the Easter season, right? And during this time is typically when people come to church, when conversations strike up about people, uh, about Jesus, even with people who may not necessarily go to church every single week, this is a perfect opportunity. Throw on top of that a major crisis, and then usually sometimes during times of crisis, like I've been noticing, people tend to reach out to God and want to hear a little bit more about Jesus during this time. They want to hear about Jesus from an expert in the field. But here's the thing, is we can hear over and over and over and over and over, and did I mention over again, and still not yet know him. You can hear him and not know him. You can hear about him and not know him. There's a difference between hearing what Jesus says and knowing who Jesus is. Because most people wouldn't disagree with a lot of the things in which Jesus said. But do you know him? Is he just somebody who speaks good words? Is he someone who can speak like a prophet? Or is he actually God embodied in the flesh? There was such an excitement about Jesus, a buzz created in Jerusalem. He was the talk of the town. There was a curiosity about him. During this Easter season, there is a curiosity always about Jesus. And as I mentioned, throwing that pandemic on top of it. In our culture, there's a lot of talk of Jesus being somebody who has something valuable to say, but is he just more than a prophet? The crowd clearly shows us in this picture that you can learn about Jesus, you can be around Jesus, you can even see Jesus in action. This crowd saw some of his miracles. Some of the people in this crowd saw Lazarus raised from the dead walking with them, and yet they still said he's a prophet. They didn't say he was the son of God. They didn't say that he was the one who would save them from their souls, save their souls from sin. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be part of that crowd because Jesus is looking for followers. He's not looking for groupies. Let me say that again. Jesus is looking for followers. He is not looking for groupies. He wants followers.
Well, guys, we have talked about two different groups that were there in Palm Sunday in their response to the question, who is this? So who is this Jesus? We looked at those who identify him as the son of David, who were thinking about this political Messiah figure. We also saw those who identified him as a prophet, but did not call him really the son of God. And the last improper response, jumping back to Matthew 16, when Jesus initially asked this question of his disciples, the proper response comes from Peter himself when he, is, when he says that he is the son of God. So Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13, we're going to look at verses 13 through 15, and we're going to see when Jesus first asked this question. So starting at verse 13. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others prophets, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So this conversation about Jesus being a prophet was already going on. But then look at the way that Jesus then shifts the question. He says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am. And if we continue to read on in the story, we see that Peter speaks up and gives the answer that we all should be saying. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, is what he says when he acknowledges it. So when he says that, he is acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, not as the political Messiah, but as the real Messiah, the one who would be the savior of our souls by saying that he is the son of the living God. This is an acknowledgement not only of Jesus' deity, identifying him as God, but that he is much more than what has been said about him by these crowds, okay? That he was the Messiah that was foretold who would be their Savior. Now think about this for a moment. Wrapping this full circle, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He's already announced that he is going to die, and he's going into Jerusalem purposely. This is the end game for him to be able to die. If Jesus is not the true Messiah, as Peter said he was, then him dying upon the cross and raising from the dead has zero significance. It only has significance if Jesus is indeed the true Messiah. If he's just some political ruler or figure, if he's some glorified prophet, then he cannot die a death that would pay the price for your sin, for my sin, or for the sin of the people that were even there and present it wouldn't mean nothing. It'd be as if I died for you. He might as well have stayed in the grave in that reality. But Jesus proved himself to be the true Messiah, the son of the living God. Palm Sunday is the beginning when the king of kings himself enters into Jerusalem and of all things with great humility on a donkey. He could have came on a chariot. He could have came with a host of angels carrying him with some Jesus smoke following him in a glittered up robe, light bright as the sun, whatever he wanted to do. He could have made some grand entrance. And if anybody was worthy of a grand entrance, it would have been him. And yet he comes in humility on this donkey, ultimately to die a death that many people would not understand and that they would reject because they truly did not know who he was. Now, I want you to catch something and not make this mistake. Sometimes I think we read the Bible and we realize and we forget that people are people, okay? Just like they are today, people were people in the Bible. And so sometimes we disconnect ourselves from the story and we think, well, pastor, if I had been there and I saw all the miracles that Jesus did, see him ra raising Lazarus from the dead and all this other stuff he did, I would have believed that Jesus would have been the Messiah, that he was the true son of the living God we probably would have fell victim just like the rest of them. This is a perfect example by the way that the crowd responds to Jesus, that you can be with him, you can walk with him, you can see him do all these miracles and still not know him, know who he is. They still didn't know who he was. They were still not really knowing the true answer to the question, who is this? Because he wasn't their type of Messiah. Because he wasn't the Savior that they had envisioned. And we likely would have been just like that. So as we answer this question, who is this? Who is this Jesus? We identify with Peter, hopefully today, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
But I want to give you even more clarity and put more flesh to that statement. Priscilla Schreier, a very well-known author and speaker, who happens to be the daughter of one of my favorite preachers, Dr. Tony Evans, shared this description of who Jesus is at a women's conference that she was doing. And it's worth reading this in its entirety. And it's like this beautiful poem full of truth, literally from the scripture, describing who this Jesus really is. This is your Jesus and this is my Jesus. Take a listen. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all time. He always was, always is, always will be, unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised, but brought healing. He was pierced, but eased pain. He was persecuted, but brought freedom. He was dead and brings life. He has risen to bring power, and he reigns to bring peace. The world cannot understand him. Armies cannot defeat him. Schools cannot explain him, and leaders cannot ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. Nero couldn't crush him. The new age can't replace him, and no one can explain him away. He is light. He is love. He is longevity. He is Lord. He is goodness and kindness and faithfulness, and he is God. He is holy and righteous and powerful and pure. His ways are right, his word eternal, his will unchanging, and his mind is always on us. He is our Savior. He is our guide, our peace, our joy, our comfort, our Lord, and he rules our lives. I serve him because his bond is love, his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and his goal for us is abundant life. I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders. His goal is a relationship with me and with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never mislead you, never forget you, never overlook you, and never cancel your appointment in his appointment book. Never. When you fall, he will lift you up. When you fail, he will forgive you. When you are weak, he is strong. When you are lost, he is your way. When you are afraid, he's your courage. And when you stumble, he will steady you. When you are hurt, he's going to heal you. When you are broken, he will mend you. When you are blind, he will lead you. When you are hungry, he will feed you. When you face trials, he is with you. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he will provide for me. And when we face death, he will carry us all home to meet him. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, and in every way. He is your God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is who you belong to. That is your Jesus. That is who he is. This Palm Sunday, you need to remember who your God is. This is Jesus. How will you answer this question? This is who he is. This description we just heard, who he truly is. So in light of your reality today, he still remains the same. So whether you are facing the loss of a job, the worry about tomorrow, how you're going to protect your family during this health crisis, look to Jesus today. He is your all in all. He is everything. He is your Lord. He is your provider. He is your friend. He is everything that you need. So let me summarize this for you today. Our one true statement is, is that who is Jesus is the greatest question that we will all have to answer. Who is Jesus is the greatest question we will all have to answer. And we can answer that now and understand who he is now 
or we ultimately will answer it in eternity. But we will all be faced with this reality. Who is Jesus? And there's three responses that we essentially saw to this question as we looked at the crowd that gathered during Palm Sunday. The first response was that he was the son of David. It was the correct identification that he was the Messiah, but he wasn't the Messiah as they thought he was. They thought he was a political Messiah, a ruler, a king who would come and make their life better. The second response was that he was a prophet, someone who speaks on behalf of God, who's very interesting and can draw a crowd, but he wasn't actually God. And the last response is the proper one, that he is the Son of God. This is the only response that matters to the most important question that you could ever ask. Jesus could only pay the price for sin if this is the answer to our question. That's the only way that he could be the true Messiah who paid the price for our sin and offer us the hope of eternal life. So here's how you can put this into practice today. I want to encourage you with two things. Number one is ask yourself this question. Who is Jesus? I can't answer that question for you. I know a number of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You rightfully believe exactly the words that I have shared with you today. But for some of you, you may not know really what you truly believe about Jesus. Is he just a good idea? Is he somebody who taught good morals or good principles and had even some things to say, maybe even about God or a God? But you have to answer that question for yourself. Who is Jesus? And then also, it's very fitting, considering this is the beginning of Passion Week, to read through the final days of Jesus' life. So maybe you start today and you read through this passage we just read in Matthew chapter 21. And then throughout the rest of this week, read through Matthew chapter 28, the end of uh, Matthew's gospel. And you, ba- you see in those seven chapters, the last week of Jesus' life, his resurrection, and then also what he teaches post-resurrection. And so you get this encapsulation of that last period of Jesus' life, ultimately his death, his resurrection, and what even happens post-resurrection. So that's a great exercise for you to be able to do on your own and possibly do with your family, do with your spouse during this Easter season, so that way we can remember that Jesus Christ is the reason why we celebrate, and why the cross can be beautiful, because our Savior is risen, he is risen indeed. Before I close with a word of prayer, I would like to encourage you today. I don't know who's watching this video. A number of you are part of our church who are watching this video, but we have literally had people watch these videos from all across the nation. I don't know where you stand with Jesus, but you have to ask the question yourself, who is Jesus? I hope that today and what I have presented to you shows you that Jesus is much more than some political figure that he's much more than some good uh, moral teacher, that he's much more than somebody who even spoke on behalf of God, but that he is indeed God. And if you believe today that Jesus Christ is God, and you have not placed your faith and trust in him, then you can have the opportunity to do that today. The scripture simply says all we have to do is believe. We believe in our heart. We confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and the promises is that we shall be saved. We're saved from our sin. Our sin is what separates us from a holy God. But Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He was buried. And then he rose again from the dead to secure salvation for us that whoever may believe in him would not perish, but we would have eternal life. So the ball is in your court today. Will you accept Jesus if you have not done so already? We'd love to be able to hear about that and interact with you. If you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can simply do it by just praying a simple prayer. Prayer is not what saves us. What saves us is what's going on internally. Internally, we're putting trust in in Jesus, and we're just communicating that trust via prayer. And you can pray something simply like this. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I realize that I have lived life on my own for far too long, trying to escape this broken world by any means necessary. But I believe that you came to this earth, that you lived a perfect life, that you were buried, you died and you were buried, and that you ultimately rose again. And that if I was to believe in what you have done, 
that I can make you the King and Lord of my life. So come into my life today, Jesus, and make me a new creation in you and help me to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time today, I would love to hear from you. Send us a private message. Uh, if you want to share even in these comments, you could do so. Um, but we would love to be able to hear from you to kind of help and guide you in your next steps in your walk of faith. But I hope that today's message was encouraging to you and also just a good reminder, especially in the middle of all this chaos, to remember who our Lord is because he is our anchor and he is our stability in these very trying times. All right, guys, you know that every Sunday at our church, one of the special things we always do is we always end with this benediction, this prayer that we pray over you as a blessing as you go about your week. And so we want to take the opportunity to be able to do that together for you right now. Now, now go, go into, into the, the world, world in peace. peace. Have, Have courage. courage. Hold, Hold on, on to what is good and honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you till we see each other again. We love you guys so much. We can't wait to see you guys on Friday for our very special Good Friday service. We'll be online at 7 p.m. Friday. Make sure you um, come and check that out. Yeah. And we will see you next week. Have an amazing week, guys. God bless y'all.